<laughs> hey guys, welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here. And that was two grown men staring at their feet for two and a half minutes. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about uh, two guitars playing together in some sort of band ensemble mix. Before we get started, I just want to say, if you haven't subscribed, uh, please subscribe. It'll be a button somewhere here. Somewhere. Um, also, a massive thank you to our patrons and Patreon Thank you, guys. Thank you. Please click the thingy down, the description text box. In the description text box, you will find all sorts of useful things like um, guides to the interesting bits in this video. So if you want to fast forward and skip all the terribly boring drivel we go through, you can do that. Also, links to our exclusive preferred retailers. Click on their websites, Anderson's Music, Rift City Guitar, and Pedal Empire, and check out what they have to offer. Yeah, there you go. Oh, finally, thank you to everyone who's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and check that out stuff. Awesome. All right, let's get started. Mick and I have been doing some gigs, and we've had a load of fun, and it's been fascinating. I, uh, up until I started playing in Tin Spirits, I'd, I'd never played with another guitar player before. I'd only ever played with either keyboard players, zoinks, or just three-piece bands. Well, briefly then, what what uh, what were the challenges playing with a keyboard player versus playing with a uh, other guitarist then? Uh, one's a keyboard player. <laughs> yeah, apart from the obvious. <laughs> The it's the frequency range as much as anything. The keys are doing generally a very specific job, whether they're doing piano or Rhodes or organ things. Um, their sounds are sort of very specific and really massive frequency range. Um, so you've got to kind of get in there and get into the relevant bit as a yeah, guitar Yeah, but I think, I think the tone of the guitar, naturally, it sort, of, it sort of worked. I didn't have to work too hard. The difficulty came when I was playing with uh, another guitar player. Sorry about that. No, no, no. It was, well, first of all, it was, it was Dave, <laughs> Dave Gregory. And because I'm... Uh, the, you know, the plan is he's coming on the show. We're going to have a chat to him about some stuff. And he's a... Uh, you know, Dave is... is well known for sort of bringing the 12 string back into vogue in the 80s with XTC. Um, but it was an amazing thing because I'm such a massive fan of his anyway. And working out um, where the two guitars sort of sit and the sort of jobs that they do. And then when you and I started playing together, and it's a, you know, it's a very different band, and it, it's, it's this whole thing of... Uh, because you, basically, it's very easy to fill up the same space. Same space, yeah. That's yeah. the question that we get asked all the time. Um, you know, you guys do loads of great videos on guitar sounds. What about playing in a two guitar band? Yes. And fitting in with the mix. We're going to try and cover. We don't have a bass player and drummer. No. But we we do have a, a substitute that we might try if it yeah. if it works. Yeah. Um, but I guess we're talking principles, and we'll try and demonstrate what we. Absolutely. What we can. Absolutely. So first of all, the rigs we're using today, Mick and I have our pedal boards out. These are our pedal boards that we use. Yes. And we're we're keeping the amps quite simple today. Uh, I'm using the Sovtech going into the um, Bob Burke cab and without any shenanigans, just straight in the front uh, sounds thusly. <laughs> So very dry, but, you know, quite a flat, even sound. Killer sound, yeah. I'm using a, a Commodore Garden Fender Hot Rod Deluxe because if I don't have my two rock, it's the next thing that I would go for. Yep. Um, just ace. You see them everywhere. Everyone's got them. Works great with the strap because of its kind of mid-hump. Anyway, without any shenanigans, sounds something like this. <laughs> Great. Might roll on just a touch more presence there. Sure. A bit more treble. Just a touch. Just a touch down. So. Has quite the nose on it. That it does. Amp. Now, interestingly, it begins. Yeah. Because Mick's gone on and he's gone, okay, I'm just going to add a little bit here and there. Now, what I'm going to do, if you play what you just did then. Okay. And 
and I'm thinking to myself, oh, he's got, there's, there's a lot of top hands and that maybe I should just roll on a little bit more. Maybe I could just turn my volume up a little bit. <laughs> and this is something to be, to be aware of because, you know, we haven't even started playing anything yet. And already you can get into this thing where you start sort of fighting against each other, Not, you know, just sort of pushing and uh, pulling into those frequencies. You yeah, know. there's just two things that come up there. Maybe we can come back to yep. We'll do them now, yep. depending on what you think. First one is, when I'm playing in here in this room, I'll set up a sound. Mm -hmm. As soon as I go to the gig, pretty much by the end of the first four bars of the first song, I turn the bass down and the treble up there and the go. presence on, turn the bright switch on right. in order to cut through the cymbals and all the rest of it. So sure. that that is standard practice because sure. it sounds kind of bitey and unpleasant in it, in it in isolation and then once you get in the band you can't hear anything because it's all lovely and round absolutely so there you go so since uh, it's, it's a really great example because i'm sat here playing by myself everything's really quiet and as soon as i do this i think oh that's lovely i oh, sorry i do have a bit of a brother on there <laughs> i think it's a fat sound it's lovely but as soon as i hear the presence and top end i know okay there's no way I'm competing with that. Yeah. You know, so what I can do though is instead of I'm not going to play what you play now. If you play exactly the same thing, right? I'm going to play something slightly different. And then okay. talk to me about unison after we absolutely after we do yeah. that. Can you? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to play the same thing. I'm going to play it through once, then I'm going to turn the bright switch on in the amp. In fact, Dan, would you mind as I'm playing it? Would you okay. mind turning the bright switch sure. in the amp on? Okay. Sure, sure. Okay. Amps really loud. I'm just going to turn it down Thank just the top. Okay. I know it's really loud. It's great. No, it's, it's perfect. It's pushing the uh, the old preamps a bit. Right. Well, this is the yeah, This is going to this is going to prove our point. So we haven't even gone into effects or anything. We've just gone into the front of the amplifier. Okay. So the the first thing we did was Mick started playing that riff. If I play exactly the same thing as Mick, it's sort of pointless. You know, I'm I'm. You know, unless I am absolutely locked in to what Mick's doing and, and all I hope to do is add a little bit of stuff underneath what you're already doing. Unless, unless it is a deliberately unison guitar part, which yes. is rare. Which is rare. OK. And but, I th this is we're going to come back to this in a minute. It's really important. Yeah. This. So the, the first thing. Uh, well, just do me a favor. Can yes. You? Yes. Just just I'll do this really quickly. OK. So one of the things we were doing there is we were both chopping a lot. Yep. And everyone's chop's going to be a bit different. Yep. So if there's two of you, if there's one, if there's one of you and you're chopping, and mm -hmm. it's great because it's all. I'm not entirely sure why we started with that part, but it's it's as instructive as any. Sure. Two things happen when you get in the band and you both start playing it. One your chops are going to be different. Mm -hmm. So Dan, can you play the part with and without chops with me, please? Sure. So, yep. Two, three, four. If you play it together perfectly in unison, yep. brilliantly, it will sound awesome. As long as you remember that probably the hi hat is probably going. There you go. As well. Yep. So at that point, one of you might just want to sit off that and not play that, mm -hmm. and it might be that both of you want to sit off it and, sure. and not playing it, depending on on what it is. So I, I've always loved unison guitar parts mm. when they're played in unison. Yeah. Properly. Sure. But I guess what we're about to come on to discuss is actually. In most two guitar bands, most of the time, guitar players are doing something different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a really great uh, example. Um, so I'm going to mention XTC again. Um, there's uh, a really great example of a tune called Wake Up by Big Express. Okay. All right. Now, 
If we use the same chord you're doing then, yeah. now what I want you to do is this. Okay, you can do that. Yeah. All right, and I'm going to play the same chord, but just something slightly different over the top. Do you mind if I go on to my uh, two and four? Go on to whatever you want. Now that's not the chord they played. Watch the reverb tells me. <laughs> Sorry. You'd think after four years I'd get it. <laughs> so that's not the that's not the chord they played. But the idea is it's the same chord. We're just playing something rhythmically a bit different. Yeah. All right. So instead of both their chopping, playing the same thing. They were XTC was so good for that. The two guitar Honestly, parts in Nigel. Oh man. <laughs> Crazy great. Crazy yeah. great. Yeah. Um, um, that was for, for all our American viewers. That was X T C. Yes. Sorry if you can't understand us sometimes. So that's one thing. Instead of changing, uh, just changing the rhythm, start keeping the chord that you're playing the same, but you can change just the rhythm of what you're playing, and that also feeds into what you were saying before. If instead of me doing the choppy thing, I'm just coming down on the on the chord and letting the chop be done yeah. with someone else. Yeah. So straight away. Instead of the guitars fighting against each other, they're, they're adding. Yeah, and the the underlying point is do something different, isn't it? Absolutely. And to add to that, don't be afraid not to play. Quite often in our band, if if there's quite a big thing happening in the first verse, I'll just stop playing the guitar. Sure. Because it, it does two things. It lets the vocal, yeah, stand out, and then. And then, but when the guitars do come back in mm. for the bridge or the chorus, everything just gets bigger. There you go. There and, you go. And I think, you know, a lot of us probably a bit of stage nerves or whatever, or, you know, you just feel like you should be doing something all the time. Sure. You don't do. You can no, just that's you right. can shut up sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Okay, so let's just choose a really simple chord progression. Um, okay. So just E, G, D, and A. Sounds right? kind of familiar, doesn't it? Sounds kind of familiar. Yeah. All right, so. <laughs> From now, many, many songs, if depending we, on what rhythm you play. It's really, like, you know. Isn't it? It's, it's hard. <laughs> it's half the gig. It's half the gig. Now, if we just play that in unison. Yep. All right. So, two, three, four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the voicing. Oh, I love this. A little bit. If, if you play with two acoustic guitars, this is especially beautiful thing to do. So the chords are E minor. Yep. Some sort of G. Yep. Some sort of D. Mm -hmm. And an A. Give okay. Go. So, same thing. Two, three, four. So, if you play your first chord for me. Essentially, they're the same notes and all the chords. They're just in a different order. That was um, something that Malcolm and Angus did very successfully. Oh, so good. So good. So good. Now, you can do that with a capo. Um, or capo? A capo, is that what we call yeah, it? interesting. A capo? Yeah, I think in, in, in America they tend to be capos, don't they? Okay. I like to wear a capo with my hat-o. <laughs> when I'm being Zorro. I've seen that-o. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 
Um, uh, in the UK, they tend to be capos, but yeah, I don't know. Capos, yeah. okay. Like, capo and the double P? Capo. Yeah, okay. po- possibly. No, I'm not saying it's right. God, heaven forfend I should suggest that something is correct, Dan. It's just, uh, it's, it's an alternative. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, so, the capo thing, capo thing, uh, y- yes, you mentioned, you know, ACDC. Zorro. Zorro. Oh, ACDC. I mean, um, yeah. But uh, when I look back at old videos of um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, yeah. lots of that going on. It's a fantastic way to do it. Yeah. Um, because it's a different register, a different set of harmonics, and at this point, our guitar sounds are quite different there. Yep. But if it's a similar guitar sound, you know, if you if you find yourself in a band with, you both play Les Pauls and you both you play go. Marshalls, it's yep. a great way to separate it out if yep. you're not doing it tonally. Sure. And we can do it even more extreme because I was only, you know, yeah, you've just got one position. Yeah. So if I let me try going up a little bit higher. Um, so, uh, okay, all right, got it. Sorry. Uh, See, he's doing all the hard work. So that's the way it works. I, now I've I've drastically changed register, and now we'll try the same thing again. Two, three, four. Sorry, sorry, I'm gonna say keep going, I'm gonna drop out and then come back in. Oh, okay. All right. So you can get, depending on where you have it, or even an octave, you know, you can get quite extreme with that. And it's it's a wonderful, wonderful way. The way you change chords, yep. the things you hammer on and off of, yep. they all impart just little differences. And you might be saying, but the Blooming Song doesn't go like that. Why Pro- not? Probably. But the song probably, all, whatever song you're playing, there's probably not two identical guitar parts. Sure. And less they're deliberately doubled. You know, if you listen to a song, there's probably, there probably are different guitar parts. Yeah. That's the point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're doing, if you've got two guitars in a in a covers thing, it's a, this is a great way of, A, making it work, but making it fun. Yeah. Doing your own arrangements with this stuff. It's I suspect great. we've all, um, and still, in some cases, if we've just learnt a song, it might be that you and I have learnt the same part. There you go. And that can be a struggle for a minute, can't it? Because we've learnt it very quickly and we've both learnt you know, the, the main guitar part, for want of a better word. Sure. Um, now, I've been in bands where that goes on for months. <laughs> and it just becomes this mess. So you, you need to kind of sit down and go, well, all right, one of us is going to have to play something different here. Yeah. So I'll just finish off that by saying we're, just, we're talking about inversions. And the capo is a really good way to do it. But you can, you can play inversions. It's just the same chords starting on different strings. All right. So if you, I'll just play some, some upper inversions of those chords. All right. And, and uh, you know... So sort of play them a bit a bit cleaner. So you play the same thing. There's no fighting. With the guitars, they're really separate parts. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're harmonically retarded like I am, and when somebody mentions inversions, you just go cold. Because you know, and I apologise, I may not be speaking to, to anybody, everybody here, but I know that there's lots of people out there who simply don't get inversions, right? And Dan has technically been playing some inversions because what an inversion means is the root... Let's say this is a inversion one of that chord... Your roots on the bottom. Yep. If you play it somewhere else, you might not play the root on the bottom. You might play the fifth on the bottom. Exactly. So or, there. If you start there, 
That's the that's the second inversion. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So there's a difference between uh, inversions and voicings. Yes. So you know the most famous voicing of all guitar chords, which is the open E major shape, right? Mm -hmm. And then in your second guitar lesson, what you find out is if you put a bar chord on, a bar across the first one, it's an F major, and then it's a G major, and then it's an A major, and then it's a B major, mm -hmm. etc. The next thing you work out is that that also works for the A shape, right? And that's where most of us stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then you get into and you go, well, actually, do you know what? It works for the C shape as well. Yeah, of course. So then you've got a whole bunch of other voicings. Yep, yep, perfect. And if, it's great. If it's if your brain can't quite get into inversions and thinking about the fifth on the bottom and the... Sure. What you, what you have access to is a load of inversions and the D shape, you know, it's just the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a different chord because you play it in a different place. So if and, you, if you, that's, and, and if you just take the, the E chord here and E chord here. So if you play, if I play this one, and you just play this one. So it's 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 different, you know. It's um, even just changing the way that, that your voice it can, it could be enough. And I still going back to your um, capo capo example earlier. I have to still do that. I have to because I'm not very good at transposing. If I'm if someone's playing open. I have to put the, the capo on and think about, well, is this going to be E or A oh, yeah. or D or G, or G shape? And that's how I think about it. Absolutely. I can't go, oh, that's an A, so the A is going to be uh, in C shape, the A is going to be wherever it is. I can't, my brain can't move that quickly. Dude, whose but, brain can move that quickly? Well, lots of people's. <laughs> okay, not mine. <laughs> so th just to give you a bit of, if, if you're not, um, you know, if your theory isn't all that and your chord shapes aren't all that and your inversions aren't all that, it's an interesting way to think about it to at least get you in the game. Yeah. And you, you have to sit down and work the stuff out. You know, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the unison thing because, you know, I when I listen to a lot of uh, Brian Adams, for example, and I know that he loves unison guitar parts, but the sounds of those guitars that, he, that are doing that are quite different. So, for example, if you just just play me any any sort of, E A riff thing with a with a nice punchy mid range rich tone. There I shall switch on my King Tone, the Duelist pedal. And if you want punchy mid range, mid range, this is sort of tube screamery. So do you mind if we don't start on E? Is that all right? Whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. That's a sound that it sits proud. It sounds awesome. Now, I can play a, a unison guitar part to that, but if I choose a midly honky, not that one. So that's. I get DA at the end, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, you know, very mid-range heavy. Um, and if I add that on top of what you're doing, this is what happens. They're sitting in a very similar space. No vocals on top of that. No, no, absolutely not. But what I can do if I change my sound, if I go to like a like a fuzzy thing, lots of bottom end, lots of top end, and I'm assuming got a bit more volume there. That's yeah, quite yeah. Quiet. Better? Give it a go. Okay, so what should happen is that this shouldn't like interfere with your tone. It, sh it should support it let's see. without getting in the way. So let's have a go. Have 
play the right chords. Yeah, it just sits out the way. It just sits it? out the way. Yeah. I can hear I can hear this guitar perfectly. Yours is still sitting proud, but there's nothing's fighting. Yeah, I wonder how you I wonder how you if you're in the melee of a band rehearsal and everything's crazy and loud. I wonder how you get your head around going. Oh, what I need to do is either add some mids in or scoop out some mids. Yeah, sure. And I guess this is one of the things that. Because then it all changes at volume, doesn't it? That's the next uh, thing. Of course, of course. Which is why headroom is really important. So, you, <laughs> you know, especially if you're the guitar player that is <laughs> with the broader frequency range, that's when headroom is hugely important. Do you think that's the way it goes then? Somebody has a broader frequency range and somebody... If you naturally lean that way, like for me, I think the way that we, that we play, I naturally lean towards the broader thing the more bottom and top the more yeah. bottom and top and yeah. you've got the, that and that and it works great and so we gravitate towards those parts um but sometimes you just got to sit down and work the stuff out all right mm. for this part of the song you know be honest okay it's not really working there mm. you know the singer can't hear him herself because there's all those frequencies are taking up all yeah, right let's big, yeah. let's widen that out a bit you know uh so all it did then was just kick on a fuzz um, but it's a similar sort of thing. If I if I kick on the rattler, So now, combining different voicings with a different frequency range? Uh, just something that I was doing there without even thinking about it, and mm -hmm. as I was doing it, it was dawning on me that I was doing it, is that just hearing the two things, my guitar sounded a bit louder than yours, a bit too brash, down on the volume a bit, down on the tone a bit. Right. Just to help it sit to, to my ears in a, in, a, in a better place. So I guess listening... I mean, that should go without saying, so, shouldn't it? But there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so often we don't listen because we're too worried about going, oh my God, I can't remember this chord. That is a huge thing. I, ha I mean, I, uh, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is listening and sensitivity because if you are playing in a, if you're playing in a two guitar band or or a guitar with keyboards, you know, where there are so much, there's so much frequency. If you're not listening and you're not sensitive to what's going on, there'll be times when you need to sit proud. There'll be times when you need to sit back. But the developing the skill of listening while you're playing in that situation. Mm. It's a big thing. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, I'm sorry if I've jumped the gun a bit there, but this is where gain stacking really, really, really comes into it because you've always got somewhere to go. Yeah. If you're gain stacking yeah. and you've got headroom, you can always get louder and you can always get quieter. Yeah. Which, if you're in the situation where you've got your sound and your amp's really cranked and that's your sound, it's really difficult to to, to go anywhere once Absolutely. you're in that place. Absolutely. And especially being aware that, that you know, if you're, you're playing songs, the song isn't all about the guitars. I mean, it should be, but generally, <laughs> you know, there's... It took me so, so long to really get that in my brain yeah. that actually it was about the vocals. Sure. It's about the song. Yeah. You know, it's about the song. It wasn't until I started listening to Crowded House, you know, back in the day, and it just... Because I love Neil's guitar playing. Let's give Neil a honk. Neil a honk. I can give Neil a honk. <laughs> um, I adore Neil Finn's guitar playing and but nothing that he plays fights with the vocals because he A is singing so he knows when to keep out the road um, and it's yeah it's a huge huge thing if you listen to the uh, listen, you know lots of people sort of tend to gloss over what Neil does as a guitar player but if you sit down and really listen to it no, man alive amazing. it's he is astonishing Just absolutely amazing uh, but the songs the songs are so important and they always come first um, so we should probably talk a bit more about frequency should we we should so I want to so, and I think we can do that by doing the rhythm guitar solo guitar thing okay all right because there's two there's some common uh, beliefs and ideas which are great and then there's a couple of misconceptions that I think we can have a look at alright um, so let's say 
I've got a big sound delay reverb. Okay, it's taking up some 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 spectrum there. And what I want you to do is have your your mid-range solo boost, okay. Gany type sound, and just play over the top of that. Right. Right, so big rhythm sound, a lovely mid-boosted solo sound on top. Yeah, both sides of the duelist there, so. Okay, now if we can show what happens when you fatten that sound up, right. all right, uh, maybe give it some more gain, fatten it up. Um, I'm gonna over fatten it, is that what I, 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 This is exactly what I want you to do. I'm I want gonna, you to over fatten I'm that over sound. Over fatten that sound by uh, boosting the bass into it putting it onto the fat here, so a really thick fat sound in isolation. That it's a great sound. I don't know about great, but it's great. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's fat. Right. So same thing. Interestingly enough, this is why a lot of people who've got a really fat solo sound end up at the dusty end so much as opposed to being yeah, yeah, down yeah. here. Because down here, they're in the same area. They can't really hear anything. I've got, you know, I've got to go up here to try and at least let some notes through. All right. But when you had plenty of treble, plenty of mid range, you could play all over the neck. It was really comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Let's just do the opposite of that. I'm going to keep the gain exactly the same. And all I've done is I've turned the bass down and I've gone onto the glass setting. So it will probably be overly trebly at this point, but it'll be an interesting comparison nonetheless. Okay. Three, four. <laughs> So no matter where you are on the neck, everything pops out. Yes, okay, it's great. You can hear it more. And actually in isolation, that probably sounds quite unpleasant, that sound I would imagine. Pretty thin, not 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 a sound I would love. Yeah, but listen to any any album with a guitar solo on it with all where all the bass has been taken out. Oh, Basically yeah, yeah, what they're yeah, doing, yeah. right? Yeah. But now what I want to do is flip it. And I want the rhythm sound to be really skinny and mid-range, and I want the solo sound to be massive. Okay, I can do a okay. skinny mid-range sound, if that's what you want. Sure. Uh, are we playing the same? Should we play some different chords? Play some different, yeah, play some different. Um, give us a clue, what do you like? Uh, actually, I want it to be a little bit groovy. A little bit groovy. I can't do a little bit groovy. Okay, do... <laughs>
Now, what happens with when you've got a skinny rhythm, right, where the bottom end is limited, it ends up being part of the the rhythm track, part of the percussion thing. Oh, that's really interesting. If you listen to, uh, there's a, the, the um, they do it with a lot of uh, Pink Floyd stuff, where in actual fact you listen to the rhythm, and what it's doing is working with the percussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because David has this massive crazy massive <laughs> solo tone right um for most of the time so having a fat rhythm guitar sat underneath that doesn't, doesn't work. work so it's got to be wiry wiry that's so, interesting again if you listen to this in isolation it's not very nice sound you know You'd probably say that you wanted some more bass in that. If you were playing at home along to yourself, you'd, you'd almost certainly say you'd wanted some more bass. But in the, the context of a band of bass and drums, it would just sit because it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt the bass at all, wouldn't wouldn't interfere with the kick drum. Yeah, it would just sit there in kind of its in its little place. So, and in rhythm tracks, this is why phases and flanges are so loved. So if, ah. if I'm doing, if I'm going from. <laughs> Put the fa flanger on that. And then you hear, if I take it out, all the bottom man comes back. So, and I can use that effect with the rhythm. And that just makes it pop. So working in conjunction with the percussion, this is when, for me, the guitar really becomes part of the rhythm section. You know, you can, you know, you can have uh, a guitar player with a, you know, with the solo sound, which is absolutely massive and loud for that example. If you ever go and see Steve Vai gig and listen to someone with a massive solo sound, that is heroically loud, right? Yeah, crazy loud. Just and it's and it's incredible. Yeah, and you hit, and what Dave Winner does on the bottom, he's so sensitive to the way Steve plays. Steve Vai, <laughs> Dave Reiner, <laughs> and that he will make the where his rhythm sits. He's not. He doesn't have this fat rhythm sound that he's trying to compete with Steve. He just puts it in exactly the right spot. Mm. So. In that sense, using things like phases and flanges, things that can tighten or the bottom end up, or just make it, you know. And then what a brilliant excuse to get more pedals. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, the thing with rhythm and solo sounds, it doesn't always have to be fat rhythm and, and a searing lead, yeah. even though that's awesome. You can go the other way, you know, and have a skinny rhythm sound yeah. and, a, and a fat solo tone over that. You know? I, I do it quite a bit with, um, like if you're playing any sort of bluesy jam, Sure. The temptation is if you're playing in C, for example, the temptation, you know, um, everyone knows loads of uh, inversions and voicings of the one chord, but no one knows any inversions of the four chord. Right. <laughs> or, you know, sometimes that happens. So if I ever want to sit out of that, Instead of just trying to chop along with the cores, I use the vent for exactly what you're talking about. A, because it might sound a bit like a rotary speaker, yep. uh, an organ, but B, because it just harmonically moves it away. So instead of trying to chop away, so if you, if you just play...
Sad. So you're doing both things. You're playing something different. Yes. Because instead of chopping away on the chops, you're just playing one sustained chord and you're changing the sound. I mean, this to a lot of people, this is going to sound so unbelievably obvious. Mm. They're going to be throwing things at the screen, but it might not be obvious to everyone. So. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And it just the second I stepped on the vent and played one chord instead of chopping, the guitars did that. And what's the other thing the vent does? Uh, speeds up and slows down. Yeah, so it adds movement. Yeah. And this is another really important thing. I've got the vibrato pedal on here. And if I... I love it so good. Just um, let's play me, a, play me a full with the G on the bottom. And play it with the vibrato on and off. Okay. Okay. So, so with that off, three, four. So going back to that unison thing, I can make that quite extreme. <laughs> okay. We are creating chorus now, by the way. Now, set that extreme is probably something I wouldn't do just on my own, but play that chord again, three, four. It's really cool. It's so cool. And, and the danger is, I guess, if when you try anything like this in the band, you'll get a couple of looks and they'll be like, what are you doing? Yeah. But I think if you sit down and work it out, that sounded great. It's, it sounded great it's to wonderful. Where I, was, it's, I hope it sounds as good on the uh, on the audio. So it's it's another great thing to do. If one person adds a bit of movement to his sound in conjunction with another person playing it quite or straight. Or sound, or their sound. Or th <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, and what I love about that sort of thing is you can actually go quite extreme. Mm. Um, That's when you start really getting into working together as a pair of yes. guitar players, isn't yes. it? Because so many, I, I, dismay is not the right word, but I, in all my time on the magazine, in a lot of the comments we get here, it'll be, I'm the rhythm guitar player and the other person is the lead guitar player. And those those roles are really strictly defined. Yep which means, you know, they're allowed to do that and I'm allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, for sure, that's the way it goes in a lot of bands. But yes, those roles are different, but they can also be, you can, you're part of a team. Absolutely. You're part of yep. one thing, which is the guitar onslaught of the band. Exactly. And working together as a team can be so much blooming fun. Yeah. Because you stop fighting, right? Exactly. And, and, and a big part of this, though, is having the conversation and mm. saying, can we try a few things? What you know? What instead of saying, "Yeah, I'm the lead guitar player, and this is my sound, and I'm gonna rock," you know, and the the rhythm player sort of working out what to do underneath? No, just yeah, just yeah. work together, and you know, because it's so much fun. One of the one of the my great honors uh, of my musical life is playing with Dave Gregory, who understands guitar orchestration better than anyone I've ever met in my life. And we've honked him already. We've honked him already. Uh, and that has been such a massive learning thing for me. The, you know, where he would put the guitars sonically, where he'd put them rhythmically, counter melodies to what vocals are doing. You know, it's, it is such a skill, you know, you know, learning when to have it proud, learning when for it to come back, mm. you know. Um, and these are things to, to be applauded and, and worked on, you know, mm. it's, and, and, when you see two, a two guitar band that does this, it's incredible. Because it sounds like more than two guitars, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's the truth yeah, of the it's matter. Unreal. Especially when you start doing stuff like that and you get all the movement because yeah. you're not quite sure where it's coming from. And... Yeah. Yeah. So what I think we might do, we've got some rhythm tracks. Yeah. Should, and... we, should we just have a quick chat about volume? 
That's a, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because there's there's one thing I wanted to say about volume, mm-hmm. and which is, what do I want to say about volume? It seems to have become the thing that playing loud is less possible for right. more and more people these days. Right. I'm trying to be diplomatic about this. You know, we've all got to play a bit quieter. And I think the way that many gigs work is that some sound engineers, trying to be as diplomatic as possible, expect you to have one level thing and then the sounds change. So, you know, when you step on your first pedal, it's the same volume as your clean sound. Mm-hmm. And you step on your overdrive and it's the same volume as your distortion, etc., etc. Valid. If that's the way you do it, great. We both come from a world where self-managing volume is, is a big deal. It's and the everything. difference between that rhythm, that distorted rhythm zone, tone that sits there underneath the vocal yep. and the solo tone can be blooming colossal. Yep. So when the sound person says to you, give us your loudest sound, mate. Oh, that's too loud. It's going to have to come down. And then by the time the band's going, it's not too loud at all. Yep. It's fine. Drummer gets on. Yeah, and that can be really tough. I mean, one of the things I've always found hardest, especially coming back to gigging again just recently, mm. is getting the sounds all sorted out and then you get in the band and then the volume jumps, especially when you're talking about big headroom and, um, you know, different gain stages. Yeah. Just it takes you a couple, few gigs, actually, to mm. just get it into a place where it's where it's going to work. And if you're not listening and sensitive to that, yeah. it'll never happen. Yeah. You know, and... If it takes a few gigs, then you're doing brilliantly. Yes. But that whole idea of, you know, your, your big fat rhythm sound being really, really loud and you can't hear the vocals. Yep. That's too loud. Of course. Your, your big fat solo sound being so loud that it's borderline deafening is fine because that's how it is in the mix. Sure. <laughs> and the other thing to remember about that is, so what the volume has given you is the ability to have dynamics. Yeah. And when you're in a band, I mean, if, you know, yeah. I've seen some amazing bands where, like, you know, go and see Joey, for example. Joey Landry. Joey Landry. <laughs> and there are parts where you can literally hear the strings in the guitar, the band comes down, it's so quiet. Yeah. And they will gather around one microphone and, and all off the one microphone. You just hear them acoustically. And then, bang, you know, something will hit you. And, and those dynamics... They're so powerful. Yeah. You know, that, that's probably the point about volume, isn't it? Exactly. It's, it doesn't all have to be that no, loud. All exactly. The time. You just using the, and that goes for two guitar players as well. So using the dynamic between the two of you, I think, is, is valuable. I'm not sure there's any way to, to really demonstrate that because I th- the perception of volume on the recording and everything is quite tough. Of course, of course. Yeah. That's, you know, and that's something to, you know, when you're playing, if you're just being aware of it can make all the difference yeah, in the yeah. world. Just saying, okay, solo's coming up and I I just, I'm going to make sure that I'm not, if, you know, I'm going to be loud. I'm going to yeah. be, I'm going to be loud enough so that I can just take my time, let the notes speak, <laughs> you know. And everyone's going, oh my God, that's so loud. God, tell him to turn down. And then by the time he or she starts singing again, they're like, oh, this is all fine. There you go. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, but but very you know very important very important point. Um, okay, I think we should have a go at playing over some tracks, and we'll use some of these concepts. Yeah, and you know, literally no idea if this is going to work. Yeah, so we've never of, done the, this. Is not planned. Lots this of is, people have said, why don't you get a band in and do some of this stuff? And we should could will maybe one day do that. But for the moment, I came in early this morning, and I put some Apple uh, drum loops down and just put some bass over the top from the loop library Mm -hmm. just as some basic chord changing backing stuff actually most of it's one chord and maybe we can just have a little play and see what we can learn and i'll see if i can mix it all afterwards so that it sounds okay okay brilliant what key do you want dan i've done a few okay what this one's in a minor should we hear it yep go for it
There's stuff there. That's all right. There's a song. Um, what you will have seen from that is was my harmonic retardedness um, talked about in the early part of the video. I'm trying to work out even simple um, different voicings for those chords, and my brain can't work that quick. So I manage one uh, and a couple of others, and then so instead of doing that, uh, I stepped on some wobbly stuff, and then in, and just did a bit of chugging, and then a bit of just to sit it away. That's quite nice. It's great. Should we try another one? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. So that was that one. Uh, and then what else have I done? Uh, that was Drums 90 Rocky. No. Awesome. <laughs> I just saw what I did. I got the, I put the vibrato one and just did a little, the voicing up high. And again, just, just a bit of movement. It's very nice. Quite great quite you see now this is place. these are simple concepts uh, but they they can sound fantastic i don't know what this one's going to be let's All see right, let's have a go
exactly what you want to see from your favourite guitar band. Two people sort of semi listening to each other, looking at their pedal boards all night. Yeah, man. That was good fun. Great. Yeah, I was trying. My brain was trying to do things that we talked about, like yeah. using modulation, like using various combinations of high gain and low volume and lower gain and higher volume. And yeah, and the, and I did a solo that had a, a fat tone, and then you came in behind that with this, with that octave, really pokey thing, and all of a sudden you've got texture. You've got it's interesting. Mm. It's very cool. That was good. That was good. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it sounds. Okay. When it's all mixed up, how much bleed we get into the thingy mics and all that, but probably be all right. I think it'd be great. Yeah. Thanks to Apple Logic and uh, all your loops. Yes. <laughs> Well, there you go, guys. I hope you found that at least partly interesting. Some stuff to try. Definitely. As always, no answers. Exactly. Only better questions. Exactly. And some, some suggestions. If you find yourself in that hole of everything sounding cacophonous, you and the other guitar player are treading on each other's toes and you're finding it hard to stick out, there are some things there to try. Definitely. Fair. Brilliant. One last thing I would say. Um... We've both been playing single single coil guitars oh, all God, night. We haven't even talked about humbuckers. Oh no! And and so you think what we've done with single coil guitars? If if I did, it's exactly the same thing that we've just done. Then I just grabbed the Gretsch out, for example. Right. It's a whole different world. All of a sudden, I've got this, you know. The principles are the same. Though, the right? principles are the same. But you can, what we're talking about with the frequencies, you can achieve that by just changing guitars. Yeah, we some of the most obvious things we haven't said, have we? Play different guitars. Yeah. Use different sounds. Yeah. Play different things. Yeah, absolutely. Those, those are the, those are the ground rules. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, no doubt this will be commented on a great deal, and perhaps. There may be some questions for more specific things we can do in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope so, because that was really good fun. Hmm. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> you think it was good fun? Hmm. <laughs> He's not quite sure. <laughs> there you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please subscribe. If you, ha if you haven't subscribed, a massive thank you again to our patrons on Patreon. Also to our preferred retailers. If you click in the description, there'll be all these really... Uh, all the interesting bits you'll be able to go straight to and also all the details of our um, preferred retailers are there and they are in the UK and Europe. And this is Music of Guildford, Surrey. Uh, in the US of A. Uh, Riff City Guitar of various locations. And in Australia. Pedal Empire. Please go and check them all out. Yep. On also, the massive thank you to everyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and uh, bought things uh, including... Oh, these strings, they feel so good, Dan. If only they were available <laughs> in the That Pedal Show store. Honestly, I just can't believe how good. I mean, like, mm. they are quite awesome, actually. I'm absolutely delighted. Yeah, that... with them. Anyone that's ever wanted to try an eleven set is there, or a ten and a half. Yeah. If you want to take it, you know, take it in stages. Yeah. Um, and uh, finally, Patreon. Did I not say Patreon at the start? Don't know. No, probably not. If but we say it again, if you're a Patreon, we love you. Thank you so much. Couldn't do it without you. Have a great week, guys. Uh, take it easy. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.